This is Open Mike Eagle, and you're listening to the Cabbages Podcast, a podcast about things you watch. You can't, you can't watch this, or you can watch it. You might be. You also might be listening to it. Don't listen to a movie because that's not, it's not as good. I wanted to buy a camera on film so bad, so bad when they were out. But I knew I wouldn't wear it, so I didn't do it. But I still, I to this day, I still feel like I owe Cam an apology because I wanted one bad. I was also broke, and they were like on the expensive side. I mean, you know, it's not cheap to make a cape. Oh, exactly. But like, um, that's he, how much I loved Camera. <laughs> Go home with me was absolutely like like proper introduction. Right, like it was a big deal, was and sweet. just like the entire diplomats world, oh, my friends God. and I were just obsessed. We just thought they were they were the only rappers in the world for a while. Truly, I loved them. Ro- Rockefeller did this thing where they just opened up these spaces where like so yeah. many times it was like you introduce a new talent and then suddenly it's like all their little like weed carriers come through and you go oh this isn't really what i wanted but like diplomats and state property were exceptions to this rule where it's Absolutely. Like actually we're going to put forward some really dynamic people and yeah there's gonna be some younger and less proven people in these crews but cameron like what he brought to rockefeller especially after the success that Jay-Z had post yeah. blueprint Jay-Z, like here he is, he comes out with this like classic album after totally. so many great albums and, you know, say what you will about his, you know, output after right. the first blueprint. I have plenty to say on that for a different time, not this podcast, but Cameron came through and showed like, Oh, this label has legs. This could be more. So and like it's just I wonderful to see that. And like it's crazy that like this movie and that album, this is all within that same span. Like here he is, he's a star, well, this, and then now he's a movie star. This show, the thing we're gonna do, combines two of my favorite things mm-hmm. and Cameron, which I could wax philosophic on for hours, but that's not what this podcast does. No, nope. we bring people on to talk about movies, and in this yes. case, we are going to talk about Cameron with open mike eagle which who's in the waiting room from what i have been told by you he's he's here he's here we got him on i am beyond stoked we have a lot to discuss paid in full with open mike eagle loads to discuss and i'm really glad that we didn't pick a basketball movie there is a lot of basketball in this we're not dwelling on the- we don't need to dwell we're gonna listen we're gonna bring on the guest we're gonna have a good time we okay don't have to talk all right about, so, all right we don't no, have no. to talk okay. about no no no, no 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 there there are some scenes that take place on a basketball court but not no. let's be betting ten thousand dollars on shooting a ball into a trash can oh, fuck basketball baby jeff you gotta stop doing this to me Man, I am excited to introduce our special guest for today's show. Joining us now is Open Mike Eagle. Now, this multi-talented rapper hardly needs any introduction, but here goes. He's put out solo albums for labels like Mellow Music Group, Mush Records, and his own Auto Reverse label. Definitely worth checking out. Stuff with the video, Dave, there is great. Previous guest on the show. One of those albums, 2014's Dark Comedy, is celebrating its 10th anniversary this year. He had some really cool merch out for this. You should definitely check that out. We'll include it in the show notes. And when he's not rapping, either on his own or in his new trio, Previous Industries, you can find him at the helm of Stony Island Audio, a podcast network behind great shows like What It Happened Was and our friends at Dad Bod Rap Pod. Hello and welcome to the show. Man, thanks for uh, paying attention to all the stuff that I shout about on the internet all the time. And you said, I might not need an introduction, but I'm here to tell you, I always need an introduction. (laughs) And I always appreciate it when I have one, especially one as well researched and 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 put together in such a fine professionalism. It's the name of the game. Good job, Gary. A lot of people either don't know that's the name of the game or they're playing some different game. You know, if you're going to talk to somebody, you got to know who you're talking to and be prepared to do it. And this isn't the first time you and I have spoken, but exactly. it's been a long time. It's been it a long time. It's, it's been, been many moons. It's been and many so moons. a lot has happened. There's been uh, global pandemics. There's been entire waves of hip hop that have happened that didn't even exist when we first talked. And Is that true? 
Other yeah, there's way? definitely some scenes. I feel like there's some stuff. I mean, I think the last time you and I spoke, there might have been like, I think we we're still talking about drill in terms of suburbans and no suburbans. So I feel like mm. there's, you know, there's a lot that's happened there. Lots you know? of, you're right. You're right. So, you know, there's been evolutions, certainly, to be sure. But uh, we're talking about a very special hip hop movie today. And we needed to bring on somebody who could speak about it in a way. Oh, you, you brought on you brought on a rapper that uh, that deals a lot of drugs. Well, yeah, we needed to bring on somebody who definitely raps a lot about pushing weight. Much, we definitely knew that. Catch yeah. up with you after the show, if you don't mind. Okay. Good. And we needed a New York native, obviously. So we, exactly. we dug so deep, I... and we couldn't find anybody. So <laughs> we said, let's get the guy from LA who has way more interest in anime than he does it's true. fucking anything else. Mm -hmm. that that's the guy to have on for this, because that's what we do here. We find the right a, guest is, for the right movie. It is a power fantasy, after all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It is very powerful. Now, which season of power is an entirely different story, and we'll leave that to uh, <laughs> to fifty to dissect. Paid in full, the movie we're talking about today is part of this sort of canon of movies uh, that kind of happened in the '90s and into the 2000s. Sort of this evolution of the crime drama. You know, there's a lot of these films that uh, have uh, taken place uh, and that have had impacted culture. Um, and led to kind of the kind of glut of stuff you see on a place like Tubi today. But I'm wondering about your experience with this type of movie, or sort of the New Jack City and Juice and and these sort of dramas. Do you have much uh, experience with or affinity for these films? Well, I grew up watching New Jack City. I grew up watching Juice, um, Boys in the Hood. Um, like that, that ilk of movies was what I was steeped in um, as a child. Like th those were the movies that, people in my family were excited to see or to show, you know, or buy from a buy, buy on a bootleg tape in front of the barbershop. Like th those were, those were the ones. Now, when you get to around this time though, cause I don't, I don't put paid in full with those because this came a little later, like you said. And the funny thing about this movie for me is that, so I watched this movie for the first time, I think when I was in college and it had been out a handful of years by then. Um, and the reason I had never watched it is because in my mind, because I never saw a commercial for the movie or anything. So I didn't really know what it was, except that it was like a movie with some rappers in it. So in my mind, it was like one of those like low budget hood Master P movies. Like, like I forgot the name of the Master P movie that was really popular. Um, was it I Got the Hookup? I think it was I got the hookup right, and I never wanted to watch that, I, and I still to this day I haven't watched that. I'm probably doing myself a great disservice by never having seen it, but in my mind I wasn't interested in that sort of thing, and I put paid and full in the same category because I wasn't um, as knowledgeable of the subject matter and hadn't dug into it. So by the time I finally saw it, I was like, "Oh, this is a fucking serious piece of cinema." here this is this has got a budget this is like done well um it's got good actors and actresses uh in it and um i was kind of fascinated when i saw it because this story was really fascinating and it's one of those things where after you see it after you become exposed to it you run to try to find out how much is real and and how much was fictionalized for the film this came out through Rockefeller, and so it would have mm -hmm. been very easy to think about it in terms of the No Limit films or like something like Three Six Mafia's Choices, the movie, these sort of things that were kind of put together. Maybe they're an hour or so long at best, and they're bundled as a DVD right. with the CD. You know, this did get a theatrical release um, and, and a wide release at that, but it was obviously not promoted in the same way, and you can thank Miramax exactly for that in the same way a lot of filmmakers blame Miramax for botching their films. That's sort of the theme we've talked about in this show. But like, if you think what Rockefeller had done before that, you were talking about Streets is Watching, and then you have Paper Soldiers, which is sort of the Beanie Siegel, Kevin Hart joke movie. Now, I haven't even heard of that one. That came out like right before it. And then the same year as Paid in Full, and this is why I think you probably was were confused or conflated it was the same year state property and state property is literally right. that i see and that you know what then that's exactly what happened because the people in my life who were watching paid in full were also watching state property and and they were taking that on as their entire personalities mm. so i decided to avoid the movies yeah get down or lay down is your personality for sure yeah, it's well, definitely it's, problematic 
I read I read some reviews from the the time of when you watch sort of a historical like far back film. You can do that and then read some from today and get like different perspectives. Sure. <clears throat> it it did pretty poorly, but almost everyone kind of unanimously was like it's not a bad movie. It's not bad. I just am really tired of this. Hmm. There was so much of this going on that every, you know, there were more studios and more people making and uh, everyone took, you know, two or three cracks at this thing. at like making a movie in the city that is grimy and captures, you know, the city soul. Yeah. And I think people were just really tired of people getting shot in New York City on screen. <laughs> yeah. It's happening a lot. <laughs> Little goes a long way. Yeah. It's an interesting time because the more, like you said before, you want to find out that that end card that says based on a true story, if you didn't know that going in, you do want to explore. It. And when yeah. you learn what parts <clears throat> of this are true, it makes the horrifying aspects of it so much more horrifying. Right. It's it's not a glorifying movie, say, in the way that Scarface is. And Scarface obviously mm. being such a big influence on not just the characters of this movie, but like it's credited for the people that this movie are based upon. Scarface was hugely influential. The yeah. one of the things the film does, which is a one of the criticisms of uh of AZ, who basically this is story is based on not the rapper AZ, I should say, mm -hmm. but but AZ Faison, who is uh basically the person who wrote the original screenplay and whose character who Ace Boogie is based on right and harris's character is based on he said they basically took seven years of his life in the rewrites and shrunk it down to like a 12 month period mm -hmm. and so like you don't get the timeline right but like 83 scarface was influential and given everything that was happening it made sense but scarface even though he ends in a blaze of glory at the end of that spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't seen scarface what the fuck are you doing with yeah, this go ahead and watch it please go but he ends in a blaze of glory, and it's glor and it's a glorification of that. This film doesn't do that. In its last half hour, it goes down this dark stuff, and it's not just playing it for melodrama. Yeah, Act three is is wild. Yeah, in this like, film, what happened, what happened <laughs> that's to Sunny? Wild Act three. What happened to Sunny actually happened, and that's mm. that's that's horrifying. That's heartbreaking. And, as, yeah. and I grew up in New York, so I remember that story. I remember hearing this story because I you'd see the cover of newspapers and uh, you can tell they condensed it too because they like you get these explanations through a newspaper and a voiceover. Yeah. And like that in and of itself is a story that you know told on camera could be wild and powerful. Yeah. And they were like, mm, do we really have time for a dead child? Let's just toss that news at you at the end and sign off. It's time to roll. No, they, I, mean, I felt like they dealt with that way. Were you surprised? Were you surprised by how much of this was true? Yeah. Um, and after watching it again to speak about it today, you know, I went and double checked, like, wait a minute. In my memory, pretty much all of this was true. When I went and checked again, it's like, yeah, this is all true. This is it's 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 nuts. Um, but it's one of those situations where this for sure would have been better served as being a season of a television show um, rather than a movie. But, you know, another sign of the times, like, you know, you see Wood Harris in this and you're like, oh, yeah, this is Avon from The Wire. And it's like this came before we were having television in this manner. It came before there was a landscape where something like this would have been available to to story break into 12 episodes which is obviously what it should have been because what you explained about the the time um the time constriction you just see that all over the place and it's like there's so many scenes where they like cut two scenes together where you're cutting back and forth between two scenes in a completely unnatural and non-story supported way but it's like they just have to move that fast to get from one thing to another, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, so they, like so much happened. Yeah. This movie is packed with it's calm action. I like to call it. There are obviously swells of like wild moments and violence and stuff, but they're earned because everything is like it simmers. Yeah. One of the things I really like about the movie is it depicts the drug dealers as humans and not like, 
you know how in a lot of times you you're explaining a drug dealer you're explaining how genius their plan is or you know like nah man he walked in and saw his boss dead and he was like I'm just going to go in and ask them if they need help and I'll yeah. be their boss. Cause that's where the real money is. That's it. He wasn't planning on being a kingpin at all and just sort of walked into it. And that's only something that someone in that position can tell you. But so, isn't it, isn't it amazing? I really loved that. Like, like in a, in a normal story where you had the time to develop drama, um, finding that you know finding that body and the tension around that yeah. uh and making the decision to go through things and like how tense that scene would have been but the way that they showed it was just him talking to the bosses and just cutting back and forth right to him finding the body like i mean it's kind of a little genius. flash of like uh-oh <laughs> yeah like it, like it's, uh -oh. it's, it's, it's oh boss is it, dead it's kind of genius just in terms of film editing to realize that you could do that yeah but Gosh, it just it 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 really just makes it overlap in a way that it just it's 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 jarring how yeah. quickly some of this stuff goes. There's there's too much fucked up shit to tell you, man. That's yeah. really it. But I think but, we nailed it on that one. <laughs> but the other side of it too is that like this is also you got to talk about when you come to a film like this as a director. It's like you come with the skills that you have, and you're dealing with a music video director essentially. You're dealing with somebody who. Uh, you're Charles Stone the third. Who? Oh, this was Charles Stone the third. I didn't know that. This is this is his first mm -hmm. feature. This is Whoa. his first feature. Like, and, and I say that I say that with a asterisk next to it because it's his first feature. Within months of this movie comes Drumline. So we're talking wow. about like he has a hell of a 2002, you know, based on these two movies. But prior to this, he had not directed a feature film before. So it's like he does like these great videos for Tribe for the Roots, Roots. like. That's what he's doing. Living color, even like he's doing these like. And I remember the the tribe videos that like he did like Benita Applebaum and he did I Left My Wallet and El Segundo. Mm -hmm. And I remember I know those. he did those. He did both of those, wow. and I remember the El Segundo vi video vividly mm -hmm. as as a young person being like, I am transfixed by this. So I think when you are a music video director, it's a different set of skills that you are applying. I have hmm. to tell a lot of stuff in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've talked about this a lot. Yeah, we got to tell a story in, 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 a, in a lickety split. So We don't have time to things. act our way through a dead body. We just got to go. And you can cut scenes in that way that makes sure. sense for me because you're trying to move the thing along. And that's why this, this film never feels long in the way some other things that we've watched no. in the season that are just the same length as this feel twice as long. Like gang yeah. related is a great example, you know. Like I never, uh, I had to like, that was like traversing a desert. <laughs> Quick addendum. Mm. Uh, he, the director oh. and his parents used to go and frequent the video store where my sister managed. Mm. So she knows these people. And I, I realized that halfway through. I was like, oh, this is to do the drum line. They would come in and my sister would be like, somebody ran a drum line. They'd be like all pumped out, you know? It's awesome. <laughs> Drama Brown is a very parents. popular film for them, and they like recommended it a lot. And the parents like ate that up. They thought it was amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. There's a lot of cooks in this too. Like the difference between you know we talk about some of those like kind of no limit films, those masterpiece films, and this is like you're dealing with a studio and you're dealing with you know some some bigger budgets. And I mean it's not a particularly huge budget, but you're dealing with a bigger budget than you might have been. You've got Miramax behind it, which is a blessing and a curse. If you talk to Dame Dash, I talked to him about it last year, and uh, during that conversation, he sort of said like you know he had people on one side yelling at him, and then he had people like you know people like Harvey Weinstein disrespecting him on the other side of it. He's like, I'm in the middle of all this. Now, mm. you, know, you can you can believe whatever you want to believe when we're talking about Dame Dash. He's definitely a, a polarizing figure. But the reality is, is like, if AZ Faison is like mad that this story wasn't told the way that he wanted to be told, you know, he, you know, he definitely, he lived that life and then he wanted to basically spend and has continued to spend the rest of his life like trying to advise people and teach people and keep them away. Dame scene life. was awesome. You know, he does all that. And then that scathing bit at the very end. Yeah. Where basically he says like, you're all using this for like mm -hmm. your little shitty music videos. The stories that were my life, you're using these types of things as music videos. You don't have to have been anybody real 
to just tell these stories. And it's just like, that's, I mean, obviously we hear that sentiment in hip hop all the time about you like, who's real and who's not, but there's something about somebody who you know now has told you a very credible story being like that money in the air stuff for him. It's like, it was no, totally. And to him, it was a fever dream to have money falling from the sky. Like that's Mm. like the magical realism that happens in this film where there are scenes where money falls from the sky and you're like, is this actually happening? Or and who like, knows who knows better than anybody how fake and weird videos can be the music just, video director yeah. <laughs> knows exactly how to block that and make it look awesome i really enjoyed the end honestly especially watching it twice like the second time i was like man this ending kind of i'd be mad at this movie if this ending didn't stick the way it sticks one of the things that's a little jarring for me though is the movie that we just did for an episode just before this one uh as we did 2003's honey another mckay pfeiffer movie mm, and i don't remember that so that's the movie with jessica alba i'm going to tell you something that's going to shock as a, and as a hip-hop and, dancer and follow you oh okay right 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 Vaguely. the community center's in trouble yes and there's <laughs> only <laughs> one way out there's only you got to dance your way out you got to do it a tale of all this time mm. <laughs> And it's wild to me because there's weird there's weird bits with that too because like one of the drumline sequels, Joe so directed that one too. Wow. Yeah. Like, so these things are weirdly interconnected. But like Mackay Pfeiffer plays like the complete opposite. He plays like the nice guy who like basically runs the barber shop and is you know he's he's decided he's not going to go that negative route. He's not going to deal drugs. Whereas Lil Romeo obviously is going down the wrong path in that film. He loves. We already discussed that. That's another movie. But it is his speech. His his speech that he gives about like why he loves to hustle, Mm -hmm. and like he wakes up and he wants to be you know like the Michael Jordan hustling. I loved that. (laughs) I really enjoyed it. I don't know if anybody else could have given it like he did. I have I have one theory um, who, Mm. who could have given a speech like that. Um, we may not have understood it entirely, but it's uh, it's Noriega. <laughs> I love we his gotta cameo. talk about Nori. Yes, I did love his cameo. Absolutely. I, I just as a person, and see, I think one of the big things, or one of the big aspects of this movie that I picked up on watching it today versus when I watched it when I was in college was that, like, since then, I have like made some television, done some acting, done some writing. And so I'm watching it with completely different eyes. So take a scene like Nori, where like, I remember the first time I'm like, oh, that's Nori. This time I'm I'm watching it and thinking about as an actor, the first thing they tell you to do in acting class is to stand the fuck still. <laughs> and the <laughs> whole time Nori is talking, he's just like moving back and forth. No. It's <laughs> like that's that's <laughs> like you bring that nervous energy and your mm-hmm. body wants to do that. But acting teachers sh- 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 cut that shit out. <laughs> just stand still and talk. Huh. But, That's but it interesting. Was, it was very it was yeah, it was very interesting to see that. I mean Dane somebody, too. Dane's like jumping up and down in his seat and like screaming at the time, like climbing over people to scream at these guys. Yeah. And you're now that I now that I know that, I'm gonna see it all the time. Yeah, so many people brought a, a surprise uh level of acting skill. Like Cameron's acting skill was uh it was immense. It was it, it was it's almost intimidating how good. He was, and this is like I'm saying, somebody who has acted. So when I'm looking at it, I'm like, Jesus Christ. Like he is he is embodying these lines. Like they sound like they're coming from his soul. And that, and that's like the hardest thing is to convey that feeling as an actor that these words belong to you. And every word he said in this film sounded completely natural. It was incredible. He was so good as the killer at the end. It's not something you expect. It's a wild twist. Yeah. And in the wrong hands, that twist would fall completely flat. This movie would be terrible. Right. But because he's shown as sort of an upward mobility type, the entire movie of like, I'm going to get there one way or another. And this is a easy shortcut, but you don't see it coming because he's loyal to a fault almost at times. But like there's foreshadowing the second time around, like you anticipate, yeah. like there are lines that he says, there are things that happen where you sort of like, this guy will turn on you on a dime. Like yeah. there's a line where he says, some people just want to be the boss to be the boss. And it's yeah. like, that, that's it. That hit like, better that, the second time for sure. So that, but like, so, and you, and because you know, it's coming the second time after the, after a few, you look and you go like, 
You can the see whole, the, the mathematics. You got, you got 14 keys in there. The math that's going on. Yeah, you it's see that it. fucking meme. He, he has a great face then, too. He has a yeah. great face of him making that calculation really fast. There were times when I saw him, the lines that he spoke, I thought, are these written for him or is he improving in this situation? And if he's improving, that's an even bigger testament to how good he is. Because there are some scenes that happen in this film that are just the, like he's beautiful moments. himself with a gigantic group of people. He's watching himself have sex on television. That does happen. And is having a conversation about his business future with his boss and his flagrant disregard for his boss's feelings couldn't have come through any more as he's like full ego watching himself have sex on screen and people and are bragging like, about it like it's a sport con like it's a sport yeah. it's just that scene was incredible you know the one thing i think that the movie really suffered from story-wise because mm -hmm. of the lack of time was that the story progressed so quickly that I really felt like the turn of uh, you know, Rico would have greatly benefited from us having more time of Rico, Mitch, and and Ace on the same page for a while. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We got that scene in the beginning, that opening yes. scene, which was great and a fantastic opening scene because it introduces the characters perfectly. But then things go from... Ace getting on to Mitch coming out of jail and then putting on Rico and then things get dark so quickly that we don't get that time of them, of the three of them in the same environment that created the opening scene. We don't really get a lot of that in the film. The, the reviews brought up a lot of like gangster films. Goodfellas came up a couple of times, I think. Sure. Yeah. And the thing is Scorsese does the opposite, right? Like he shows hours of the good times right and then the bad times is clapton song you know what i mean and that's or the stones or the stones or whatever yeah exactly like you know one way or another the bad times are sort of like i'm gonna zoom you through everything because it's brutal yeah and and it's actually more fun to get to know these people when they were on top i mean and it, it really helps accentuate the darkness when you right. ground it in these characters love for each other too mm -hmm. like if you show that then it's really fucking shocking when one of them yeah. decides to go selfish right and i think if we especially i mean if you think about yeah. the events the events that were sort of glossed over i mean the way that we're shown the loyalty of of rico is a jail fight that he jumps in on the side of of our hero in a in a jail fight from there it's really just that's it that's the only time those two people except for when they're eating food once right are yeah. like really even together but the zimo scene in the absence of everyone when they are just out there after ace has been shot and there's that guy in the car taunting sort of saying like what calvin's got you all shook and then that just triggers him now yeah. apparently according to wood harris that scene where he pulls him out of the window that is all camera like he actually does a lot of what you see in that hits that guy. Like he actually hit that guy. He oh, actually shit. does strip him down. That was actually a thing that happened because that's who Cameron was. <laughs> like, it's so important to remember that like there are aspects of this character that clearly are meant to be Alpo Martinez. The, mm. This is based on mm -hmm. Alpo Martinez, who you may have heard a couple of years ago, got after being in witness protection. Cause that's another true thing in this story is yeah, he right. did, Speaks the snitch on the dc guys exactly yeah. he won't talk about the harlem guys but he <laughs> told the dc guys that happens and then he comes back to harlem and he gets shot dead in harlem back right. in 2021 mm. supposedly over a uh, traffic dispute but you can't know that yeah certain. can you to anyway. be fair when he when he caps old boy in his car uh you know that's a traffic dispute yeah, sure. Exactly. You can call that a, a dispute. dispute that happened in traffic. In traffic. Absolutely. Yeah. He oh. pulled up in traffic and was like, hey, oh. but I think everything I mean, that we know. And it was chain snatching season in this, in this, oh, yeah. In this movie. Chains were snapped, snatched. But everything sure. we know about Cameron in, is that like is validated by by that. Like it's like it's like, okay, knowing who he was, knowing the type of person he was, knowing who he is today, kind of seeing the things that we know about him, it's like Oh, there's a the credibility is there because this is like you put him in the best possible debut role you could put him in in a movie. Yeah. 
And he's only done a handful of films since then. You know, he. I certainly feel like he should have done more. After he could have easily, if he wanted to, I feel like he could have been, you know, a great character actor, especially in the age of things like The Wire mm-hmm. and, and shows like that. Like, I think he could have done that. I think on a show like Power, for example, or a similar thing like that, he could absolutely have done. I think it shows on that podcast methods. he's on with Mace, too. Well, that's the thing. He's chosen I think to it take shows that that energy. Like hilarious and lively and like could absolutely do it. Yeah, he was great. And he, and it's like the thing with Mace, the energy as with Mace in that, and, and on the show is just like, oh, it makes sense because they've known each other since 1993. Sure. Like since Report, like Children of the Corn. Like Children of the Corn. They've known each other forever since Big L was rallying them together. And it's amazing to see that friendship after all these years and the ribbing and the nature of that friendship, obviously. Wow, that met Gary like 30 minutes ago. It's, yeah. <laughs> you know, we and just already report. I just don't think it's working out, though. I think it's maybe this is this might be the last episode. And this is how they find out. (laughs) Sorry, everybody. We're quitting the show. My bad. This is it. Um, (laughs) Five times at this point. (laughs) I'm quitting. The the, the thing about about this, too, is and and I'm not sure, again, like everybody comes to these things a different way. Like before I watched this movie, my first engagement with Paid in Full was the soundtrack. Mm. I was a big fan of Rockefeller. And when this movie came out, they did a soundtrack for Paid in Full that was two discs. And the mm-hmm. first disc is songs in and inspired by the movie. And the second is just a mixtape uh, that's hosted by DJ Clue of just all Rockefeller artists. I didn't I'm looking at the soundtrack now. I didn't realize that that's where a lot of these songs live. Champions? Like, champions what? I had no idea that the first time on. the first time i ever heard kanye rap wow was i picked up this thing i put disc two in my disc man i'm at like i'm at like a, i'm at a long island railroad station in queens i put this in my disc man and i already knew who kanye was because i was a big rockefeller fan so i knew him as a producer i was you know keeping up with him and just blaze and bank and all these guys and then i'm like i put this on and it's like Dame Dash is here screaming at me, basically being like, hey, you know, he raps too. And then boom, there you go. Kanye starts rapping. And I'm like, okay, all right, this is this is something. This is happening here. And I'm like, this guy also does this. Wow, I really need to fucking he needs to put out a record. <laughs> you know, that's wow. something where the where the head goes. So like, and there's some amazing things in that soundtrack. Like, there's the like um, I don't know if you're a a, a fan of that first diplomats record, a diplomatic immunity, but I'm ready first appears on the soundtrack. Like, you know, I know the, all those songs. I don't know the names of any of them, though. Cause I've yeah. heard them all a million times, but I never sat and listened to the album all at once. Well, that's the thing also with all that Heatmaker stuff is like they had a certain sound and like mm-hmm. the Heatmaker sound that dominates that record. Like you hear it on these beats, you hear it on some of these tracks here, but like everybody's on this project. Everybody who was on Rockefeller, all the state property, all the Philly guys, like everybody's in this. And like it did okay. Like it, it appeared on the charts, like I think in the Billboard 200, like in the 50s somewhere. Sometimes we talk about these movies, like when we did gang related, it's like, Tupac blockbuster. Kind of it goes up to number two in the charts. Like yeah. it's, was yeah, there a one, single on that one? At least in terms hit. of Wikipedia, it's not showing mm. any singles for this one. And I wonder yeah. if it has something to do with why it didn't necessarily hit. Yeah, I mean, I don't think they re- I think they kind of approach it in the same way they do the mixtape thing. Like the first disc is stuff like Eric B and Rakim, yep. obviously Phil Collins. Classics. I-, I wanted to get your impression though, because Phil uh, sort of got this contract because of Phil Collins thing. I want to get your impression because that song has been used in a lot of different things over the years. What was your thoughts about the way in which it was used in that scene outdoors where everybody's flashing? I don't know. I, it, because of its usage, I tune it out when I hear it. I, I felt like there was like a drum track over it or something, but I couldn't tell if that was in the original or not. But that was that was my thought. Like I heard the song. I was like, oh, this song. And then I heard this drum. Like, I don't know if this drum is always there. And then I stopped thinking about it completely. I feel like I have like, and, and Jeff, you can tell me how you feel about this, but like, I feel like I have like a Pavlovian response when I hear that song and I'm watching a movie. I'm like, something big is about to happen right now. <laughs> Someone is going to get shot something tragic or wonderful when, something big is gonna when happen. that drum fill kicks in we're losing somebody mm. something's happening they're gone this is a movie where people die they're gonna die yeah whoever's in this scene <laughs> and it's not even foreshadowing that moment it's just like it's just a snapshot of what life is like in that time at that moment totally what were your thoughts on the uh the fashion kind of in in that the all the, the fits that people got off in this movie mm. see that's the thing like that's i 
that was my great resistance with this film at the time was that like I just knew so many people who dressed like this. Like I'd like I just and and I feel like the movie is supposed to be showing an older time than it actually is, but it like it should be period, but it's not. Um and you know, at just the big denim and the big leather coats and and you know the big thick chain. Like I just knew too many people. Like I said, that this aesthetic was their entire personality, and so I am glad as a culture, uh, in many ways that we've moved on from it, fashion wise, sure. um, <laughs> like thickness of chain. Oh, there's uh, a lot of all, all sorts of reasons. I'm glad that we we're we're doing something different now. Yeah. What's crazy to me is that like I watched one of the watches I did, I did with my wife. And the first thing is she's like, what year is this? Because she's way more fashion savvy than I am. Like I am hoodie and, right. and, a, and a hat. Like that's basically like my life. Yeah. Since she like, looked at, she's, like, she's like this. She's like, this is not 1983. How could this be 1986? Mm -hmm. How could this be that? It's like, and I said, okay, well, what if you, what if you account for like uh, Dapper Dan? Like what, do you, I mean, and, and she's like, even then, there are things happening in these scenes. It's like they did not have the right person handling wardrobe for this. Well, they probably didn't have the money. They probably didn't right. have sure. the budget to completely do period wardrobe. Yeah, except for Calvin. They had everything for Calvin. Mm, true. He basically is there when he's in the stairway trying to yeah, get a Calvin, like, Calvin was fly. He was wearing the right things. You're right. Definitely. Yeah. I want to wear more blank trucker hats. No. <laughs> for sure i think it you know i'm tired of logos on my life you know what mm -hmm. i mean everything's a band or a logo or something no so i just like i just like green gonna, your state is going to be like just dress like a movie could break out at any moment at any mm -hmm. moment yeah i'm with that it would be a, a real change because since like 91 92 my whole wardrobe has been nose people in bands or nose skateboarders mm-hmm <laughs> not in bands, not a skateboarder, but he hangs around those dudes for sure. That's been the whole aesthetic. So, you know, maybe that would be a, a nice change. I wanted to see more stuff like more period dress because I feel like it's it's important when you're telling these stories. It keeps you in the moment. Like, you know, Shy McBride as the proprietor of the dry cleaner, mm, you know, yeah. how he was dressed, how he was behaving. He seemed he absolutely great. credible. Because again, I feel like that's somebody who's like, I was there. I was alive during this. I was an adult. I can absolutely credibly put on something like this. Uh, but I have to ask, because I feel like I missed something with, with him. And I'm hoping you might have a sense of it. Was he running numbers in that store? Yes. Yes, he was, right? That is what he was doing. And he was yeah, talking okay. all, you know, talking all that shit. Oh, yeah. He was high and mighty. Yeah. But he was but cheating yeah, he system was too. Definitely running numbers out of the dry cleaners. Yeah. I because like the second time I watched this for this episode, I put on the captions and I I, I pay attention because it makes Nori's speech, by the way, amazing when you watch the <laughs> captions on. Especially when he goes and he goes, I water. And I'm like, that's perfect. And like Noriega, like and I, like, we grew up like two blocks from each other. So mm. it's sort of just like I mm. see like I know this dude. I know the, exactly the kind of person like this. That's amazing. But Hell like yeah. when when you get the captions, you see what what Shai McBride is saying every time he picks up the phone, and it's like he's talking to people who've lost money. It's like yeah. it's clear at that point. So I wanted to make sure that I read into it correctly. Like he absolutely was sitting there. He's a bookie. He's definitely mm -hmm. it's, and it's then telling amazing. dude not to go make a quick buck. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. The audacity to be like, well, what I'm doing. But like this goes back to the mob to the kind of mafia movies, the kind of stuff we're yeah. talking about here, where it's just like, well, we'll do we'll we'll rob trucks and we'll do this and we'll steal, but we won't sell drugs. But don't suddenly... sell drugs. Even though I demand an insane amount of money from you off the top of everything and yeah. you've got goals to meet, don't make it easier on yourself. <laughs> it's like every Scorsese movie is like, we don't do the drug stuff. It's like, come on, man. That's the story. I think when we watch that that shitty uh, John Travolta Gotti movie, that's exactly God. the same thing. You know, did oh, you ever see uh, John Travolta movie. play Gotti? John I have Travolta not. Played John Gotti. I, I would never choose to do that on purpose. <laughs> no, well, we did. Let ask me tell you something. I'll tell you two things about that movie, just so you know them. It's mm. zero percent on Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> zero. Uh, zero percent. Wow. Not one wow. percent of the population was like, "Yes, please." Damn. And the second thing is it's three hours long. Oh, no. No. Well, it's yeah. so long, dude. I'll never do that for free. No. Gary did that to me because he was mad I at did. me. I well, was Rick Cross with you, perhaps. I hope it worked. 
Well, we we almost we almost stopped this whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> can we? Can we, we talk almost about killed each other that season. Can um, we talk about something happier? Because I want to talk about I, I mean, this movie. Yes, because there's some really <laughs> happy moments. Like, right. I'm sorry, but we get a Dougie Fresh performance in this. We movie. do. We do. And Busy B's hanging too. Busy B and Brucey B. We get both of these guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like absolute legends. Like I don't know. I had never. I, we recently watched uh, for this for this season. We watched Crush Groove, and mm-hmm. so we got to see a lot of performances in the moment mm-hmm. at that time. Basically, what it was like in the '80s is seeing people like artists like Run DMC play, and what it was like for them to be on stage. So, like seeing Dougie Dougie Fresh up there doing like this stuff in the club for the secret Mackay Fivers, like I need to get out, I need to like be out and like really be out in a big way tonight. Like it's wild they were to pull up, and that you know Dougie Fresh doesn't look. I mean, just look the aged a year. He never him. looks like he. He still he still looks exactly the same. Yep, it, it's incredible. You know, to see that was like, you know, obviously you've got like Eric being rock him. You've got that in the soundtrack, but it's like, it was wild to me to kind of see him in there. Obviously, Brucey B and Busy B with the, you know, on their actual shirts, having the, the names helps too. But like Brucey B is all over this. He's on the, ra- he's on every single, like in the, yeah. on the radio. Mm-hmm. Like they did a lot of work to, to maintain a certain amount of credibility for the period that you have to give them respect for, where I think t- these days someone would just slap on a CGI or, or, or an aging sort of thing. And then you get your, you know, your Al, your Al Pacino, Robert De Niro, Irishman stuff. <laughs> it does. It does seem like part of the spirit of this movie was people who grew up in Harlem sort of celebrating the time and space that they came up into. And so it seems like, part of the spirit of this was finding moments to showcase those legends who were still around because they meant so much to, you know, definitely the Dame. And I would imagine um, some to the, to the, to AZ and, and anyone else who lived at that time as well. But it seemed like it, it's, it's not only telling the story of these people, but it's also celebrating that era for the things that were to be celebrated about it. Yeah. I think that's absolutely correct. And I think that for someone like AZ with, with, with this is to have people like Brucey B in there and like shouting him out, you know, on the radio in that, like, I feel like there's something about the way in which AZ is presented. This is sort of like this, like benevolent drug Lord mm, in a lot of right, ways. Like he's, right. he's not just out here trying to conquer. He's like, we're going to focus on. Harvard no, he wanted to, he, he said it. He wanted the, the neighborhood to eat off of Everybody the eats. money that he was bringing in and he wasn't flashy to he cars were a fault mm, a but like you didn't see him that's where that wardrobe really crazy went. clothes he was just like i'm i'm trying to stay away from trouble and like there's that kind of tossed together scene but it's it ends up being really important where he, he meets the cops that end up arresting rico yeah, they figure out wardrobe for that scene. You yeah. know those guys are cops. <laughs> totally, <laughs> and the way they talk, like they really nailed it. Yeah, that those that dudes were good. trying to integrate themselves with the streets, and we're like, "Hello, fellow gangsters! <laughs> Isn't it time to link up for money making schemes and whatnot?" Drugs. They walked like cops. They walked totally. Like cops. All it was great, and he says, "You know, they're either stick up kids or cops. I don't want anything right. to do stick with them. up kids or the feds." But he, yeah. But he kept him right here because he knew those dudes wanted in. And he was like, okay, I know how to take care of this situation without having to kill anybody. He didn't want to be violent. When violence was brought to him, he crumbled in the clutch. For sure. Like, yeah, he was beaten, shot in the head, (laughs) in the head twice. Like he was shot. And like people were could really like get under his skin and i thought they did a good job of showing that and another that, thing I th- it really think- was cam or rico that like stepped up and was like we not we're not getting taken out of this this is ours another thing i think they did really well and this was sort of served by the shortening of the time was that they showed how how violent things get quickly when the stakes are raised like that when you start getting into especially that time period of the drug trade like and because that's also the story of how like all of the street gangs that we're aware of now most of them started as like community protection but then once the drug trade started everything got violent very quickly uh and i feel like they did a good job of showing that like 
how how cool and low key your life could be if you weren't into that. But once you turn that corner, it got real violent real fast. And I felt like that was one of the places in the story that was served by the fact that it moved through the story so quickly. I'll I'll add one to that where a good gangster movie, no cops. Right. The very right. end, that one scene where he meets these dudes and he's like, mm, they might be cops. And then later they they're shown again as cops arresting camera and that's mm. pretty much it even with the shooting even with the ambulances showing the people you know in the hospital when they're like accessories to wild shit no cops but i, I think like, i want to go back to, gangsters go back don't to, really hang around where the cops are <laughs> but, I, but like, i want to go the whole thing but I want to go back to that point because I think it's really worthwhile that, that that Mike was saying. Like the part of what AZ's argument is and what and thus AZ Spooky's argument is, is that like if we just stay in our own lane mm -hmm. and do what we do and not attract attention, these cops don't want to be here anyway. And they're going to ignore us for the most yeah, part. Yeah, precisely. He was making this – I wish that he had made it more you know, vociferously. But he m tries to make that point with Cam when Cam's watching himself – bang someone on tv gun in and, hand by the way while he's watching yeah with a, like two guns in hand having like a he was a cowboy and dude did not want a cowboy in the ranks because that's what brings the problem like when he shot dude in the ass mm. uh ac was like hey man put the gun down put it put your gun away idiot you know like, don't wave your gun around if you're gonna shoot someone you need to get the fuck out of here interesting thing too is that that attitude is somewhat informed by the guy who runs the dry cleaner shop was perfectly low key mm. running this front business. I mean, not even front bill, legit business, but and also that's truly why he doesn't want drugs in there out of the back. Yeah. And it's like, he brought that same attitude into drug dealing. Yeah. You get that. And I think the contrast is like, if you know the stories of what was going on in other parts of New York at that time, like there's a great book that, that came out uh, probably about now, maybe 15 years ago. Um, that talks about what happened in Queens and like, it's a way more violent story. Like it's way more about just like this gang and this gang, this rival crew and this rival crew. Like it isn't this it was like, the the first story time of, of unity, of relative unity. Obviously there was so much money flying like around. And then when you get piles of money, the easy button is to just go take that pile of money. I mean, that's shown very well a couple of times in this movie. Yeah. So it's it's a it's an interesting contrast because if you watch say state property, it's the opposite of low key. State property is a film about it's being as wild. cocksure <laughs> as you really can be. And look, yeah. it is entertaining as fuck. I own that mm. DVD and I watched that movie many times. And it's a real delight if you like to just see rappers that you know and enjoy on the screen doing not necessarily great acting roles, but doing their thing. And Beanie Siegel, you know, to his credit, has some real dynamic qualities that that he has that stuff that he does on the mic absolutely translates to that performance mm -hmm. but it's one mode it's one mode is this like righteous cocksure like boss attitude and that's the kind of thing like if this movie didn't have the balance of you know the friendships between wood harris and mckay pfeiffer and that's a relationship that then cameron entering in kind of throws something to the mix that makes it a bit more volatile it wouldn't be the same thing if you just had a camera on it this movie was right. about that you're not going to get an alpo right. movie martinez movie is probably not you know the best way to tell this story you need that dynamic between three people it's why it makes for an entertaining film rather than yeah. you know just trying to make another scar it's definitely i didn't think it was a slog or anything i really enjoyed this one actually at the end of the day, and you can tell me if you feel differently, I feel like a lot of filmmakers, especially now as we get into the sort of like the digital filmmaking, the the lowering of these kind of thresholds to make something and then getting like the kind of 2B movie category that exists now where it's just like everybody can just make this with you shoot it on an iPhone or shoot mm. it with the kind of thing that makes, you know, an easy YouTube video. But like they're taking the wrong lessons from these movies in terms of filmmaking and storytelling, I feel like. It's just the like violent story and not necessarily the relationships and the narratives that mm -hmm. it misses that aspect of it that's one of the things i've learned um in trying to make stuff um trying to make tv trying to make film um it's been a lesson i've had to learn over and over again because 
what tends to interest me about a story is the wild premise um is the you know the the subversions um you know all, those are those are the things that interest me like these big swings and world building and all of this but i have to constantly be reminded of all the time is that what makes any story work is a grounding in character like like a uh having characters that a viewer can relate to and understand in the midst of everything that's happening um is one of the most important parts of making a film work. And I, and I think that you're right about that. Like if it's just Alpo, then it looks like, then it looks like a black exploitation movie or something. It's, it's too, it's too absurdist. If you just get the hyper violence and the over the top character, but when you ground it um, in when, and the other, the other thing that hit me watching this movie, this is the hero's journey. They did the yeah. fucking hero's journey. Mm -hmm. like legit tale as old as time they did the hero's journey movie about drug dealing show show me who's who's done a better job at that yeah i don't i don't know i mean i i'd, I'd have to relook at a lot of movies i've seen before with the with these same eyes but it really leaped out at me today like holy shit this is like this is the basis like we tr there's a film that i feel like and unfortunately it, it ends in, in pure tragedy but like a film that jeff and i watched just a couple months back and that's, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but uh, Leonie Jasso uh, did a film uh, with Wesley Snipes called uh, Sugar Hill. Oh, and yeah. I saw Sugar Hill when I was real young, so I don't remember it very well, but I did. They see. they were showing it at like film, forum, film. film yeah. forum for like two screenings. We went to one of the screenings. It was like a late night screen. It was like that and Pinetto in the same night. So Benjamin Bratt. So like two outstanding films. from. This we went out in the worst Back storm. Back. I've, I've one of the worst storms I've ever walked through in my life. Oh yeah. It was crazy. It was so bad that they were supposed to have a family member of uh, the director come in and speak. And they didn't even announce she wasn't coming. They were like, you should, you know, she's not coming. It's, it's, it's <laughs> not it's happening, point. dog. This but, ain't happening. <laughs> but it's another story uh, kind of like this. Obviously, it's 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 a fictional account, but like it's a story of somebody who achieves the level of success, not unlike what, you know, mm -hmm. what AZ experienced in his real life and not un unlike what's depicted in, you know, Money Making Mitch and, uh, and Ace Boogie. But it's like you have two brothers essentially in that actual like blood brothers that they're basically one of them is saying, let's just keep going. Let's just keep going. Let's keep going. And the other one is like, I have reservations now. I would like to have an exit strategy here. Right. And that's, I feel like you don't see enough of that, like regret that's in a way that comes from a place of like, I've seen success and now uh, yeah, what does any of this mean? And I feel like that's something that that's done really well is like when Ace Boogie, after being shot, really gets a per his his perspective changed. It says, I, I'm breathing different. Like lines like that. that like, was, those are existential questions. That's a wonderful yeah. line. I really his, like, what a wonderful, like I'm breathing different. Like, yeah. Whoa. His, his All right, I'm going to take a pause for a second. You right. know, because you there's a, a there's a two Dness in a way to to movie making sometimes where yeah there's so much violence that you don't even really think about there's especially American Sims is really bad at this where people are shot stabbed whatever and then they like get up and fight people mm, yeah. still but we have a superhero quality to the heroes of our stories and this one did not <laughs> it did not that dude was obviously suffering in those scenes and, and obviously that ending is is fictionalized in some way like you know i don't know what that's written by someone who's been shot did. but but like that's <laughs> but that part is credible and again there's whether or not he feels his story was told properly in it you know dame dash has talked in recent years i mean i he brought it up when we spoke before he's thinking about exactly what we talked about before he wants to do something longer form with this story and change yeah. the perspective of it i watch and, it and tell it in a way that maybe speaks truer to the actual tale in reality than what we saw yeah because i i mean he, i agree interested. with a lot of the reviews i read that were not even harsh or critical they were just like this is this is you guys tried to do something cool and it didn't quite get there fair enough i just also really enjoyed watching it so it's a thumbs up for me it was yeah. a thumbs up for you know most of them were like yeah if you want to see i mean it's it's a good addition to this canon but this is this is being done a lot and this isn't the best version 
you know, Dame Dash has set up his studio and if he can, he's been making kind of these smaller films and if he can continue to finance them um, through the independent channels that he's trying to do, we may very well get like the serialized TV show version of this story. I hope so. That may actually happen for us. So wait and see. Well, look, I want to thank you so much for doing this with us, man. This was an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for having me. And this was a great thank movie you. to rewatch. So I'm, I was glad for the opportunity. I picked up a bunch of stuff looking at it again with, with, with these eyes. So, yeah, I appreciate yeah. that. This movie, for like just for the Cabbage's sort of curve of films. Mm-hmm. This is masterpiece theater. Oh yeah, the performances are fun and weird and cool, and Moving. there's a collection of dope folks, and the the plot, even if it wasn't perfectly executed or whatever, is real plot, not like I don't know. I just this was really cool, and it. I don't know that we really got a chance to talk about it mm -hmm. with OME, but like. This movie is is so deep and rich in rap culture. Oh yeah. This movie is so deep that you don't even realize Angie Martinez is in it. Right, exactly. I blink you know, it's like she's just sitting there laughing at Dame Dash's jokes in a car. I had no idea until I looked at the crowd. I was like, oh, I owe Angela Martinez. Oh, totally. Oh, absolutely there's there's so much of that when it goes through the first time it went through i was like oh of course that was nor of course that was nor right of course because like i just there were so many people in this film that you almost forget how many dope performances there are like this is my argument for why we're doing this season why yeah. we basically took last season's kind of rapper movie concept and continued it out because my argument is that there's this very limited, narrow scope of what rappers can do on film. Right. And I feel like, you know, there's a lot of people who basically say like, okay, fine, we'll take New Jack City and we'll take Juice. But like after a certain point in time, they're just like, no. And I think Mike put it really interestingly where he's just like, he originally thought this was years ago. He thought this was basically on the same level as a state property. You know, right. basically it was just going to be like, a really low budget slap together sort of thing that if you like that sort of movie, you'll enjoy, but it's not necessarily sure. what he's looking for. And what instead you get, and he kind of accidentally summed up the issue, right? Where they were just like, yeah. we were inundated with these films. Yeah. They were coming out one right after the other, right after the other. And after a while they were the, the thing that, that is for forgotten. I feel like when you go back to the nineties is that, the commercials were just packages for the trope of the film. Mm -hmm. That's it. They weren't trying, like, they didn't give away key things back in the day. They didn't. Yeah. It was just a voiceover with a few yeah. lines, basically. Right. Maybe, maybe an action shot of something going down. But certainly they didn't, like, give away guest appearance. They didn't give away any of the sizzle or any of the stuff. It was all yeah. sizzle reel. Yeah. And some guy being, like, in a world, you know, or... Mm -hmm. streets of the gritty streets of harlem 1986 mm -hmm. and that's just how we were sold movies that's just how you had to go and experience it and like it or not like it they weren't pandering to you at all they weren't yeah. giving away the best jokes like i don't like seeing previews for comedies since it's like 2010 stuff. because they're just like here are the five best lines in the film the rest of its plot eat a dick yeah, it's, and it's, it's you know what I mean. It's like, and then the, the worst thing is the red band trailer, where it's like, okay, all the things we couldn't show you in the theaters, like in the in the, the theater preview, like here's the right. red band trailer. And now we're going to oh, give wow, you the five okay. best lines, as you know what I mean. Here's the ten best lines. Then, <laughs> oh yeah. great, red band. So I feel validated that we did this film because, like, unlike some other movies that are sort of considered like in the rapper movie canon as classics, this one isn't like. 
universally loved it's not critically respected like i think as you put out like a lot of the critics were like kind of grudgingly okay with it like ebert yeah, sort of like know, like ebert i hate ebert's review of this i hate ebert's review of this movie I do he too. Does is, he's basically like, just he's like so focused on enron he's so fucking focused yeah, on enron yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's like this isn't a movie about that it happened to coincide in terms of release right. with that scandal that, that thing was on his mind and he wanted to write about that more than he yes. wanted to write about the movie right and it's that like, kind of sums up the time period we yeah. were we were getting these were getting shot out of a cannon at circuses yeah there wasn't a lot of respect for what it was and yeah. i think that the difference really with this film is that it's a story that is not told with pandering and despite what it, the impression that i get um you know az's criticisms of this film it, Shout it, out it my seems, which uh seems to be that um fuck you fucked me there <laughs> you fucked me there uh, that's the impression that you get it's terrible it's it seems like right. a good place to end it fuck this movie was fun go watch it it was fun. fun yeah go see it honestly if you and haven't you seen it fun phone. and also tragic yeah. it's a tragic you want to see hey would you like to see so, a good movie go watch paid in full go watch paid in full it's a good Cabbage movie is non-warning non -warning. <laughs> go watch paid in full it's yeah. good it's, it's good fun. maybe and maybe I think it might be great. Whoa. It's the Cabbages Podcast Network. <laughs>